As business owners, entrepreneurs, family men, it's difficult for us to find the time to put together projects like these. Even though it's something we really want to do, unfortunately, taking care of the things we have to take care of comes first. However, because of viewer support from people like you, we're able to continue doing this. Please consider joining our Patreon and supporting the Burn and Return podcast. Listening to Burn and Return, a weekly one hour podcast covering news from the agricultural and turf grass industries. What is going on, everyone? Welcome to Burn and Return. This is the show, the only show in America. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is the only show in America that burns down the weekly news of agricultural. And turf grass. The green industry whip around right here. I made all that up, but I don't know. I've got my two lovely guests with me tonight. Ryan DeMay, how are you good, sir? Matt, I'm well. You know, it's uh it's nice to be here. And it was uh it was refreshing to watch, you know, some of the YouTubes this weekend and, and see what came out, you know, some uh some long form pros as it is. So thank you, you for know. that. You know, we'll we'll take a we'll take a little bit of time here to go ahead and discuss that. But before before we do, Ray Ito is in the house too. How are you, my coconut Wi-Fi friend? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. I was concerned you weren't, but you made it in, and everything is back yeah. to normal, and life is good yeah, again. I made right? it in. Life is good. Life is good. I mean, uh, somebody asked me about my background, and this is an actual. Burn about to return, ladies and gentlemen. This is what smoked goose grass looks like. Oh yeah, that, that definitely in looks like smoked grass goose grass. In a Bermuda grass green. Would you take it out uh, with Ray? Yeah, what was on it? Oh, let's see. Spray mix was uh, Sincor, Tenacity, and Dismiss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's called taking care of business. That is the TCB burn down for goosegrass, if I've ever heard one. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, let me ask, Ray, why use tenacity in lieu of Pilex in that application? Just for grins and giggles, that's what you had? Oh, not only that, uh, it is because what we found here in Hawaii is that if we start with a warm-up of tenacity, then the Pilex that comes two to three weeks later then doesn't bleach out the desirable Bermuda grass as much. Oh, interesting. Now, that mm -hmm. is interesting. And I can't use the trichotel still... trick we can here in cold season. Are you no, using I, fractional I ounce rates? Uh, are you doing like a quarter ounce? On the pilot your goosegrass control yeah okay if i'm if i'm running pilex i i stop at a half ounce per acre that's all it takes okay. half ounce uh, half ounce pilex four to five ounces uh syncor df and four ounces uh dismiss or sulfentrazone 4sc on top of that gotcha Jeez. <laughs> Gotcha. Um, for those of you that haven't seen it, uh, I did a very long uh, one-hour re -educa Basically, I just read a bunch of humic acid studies for an hour uh, and just took bits and pieces from the conclusions that were pertinent information and, uh, and then explained why the ones I didn't choose, why I left out the information in those. And I thought I thought it was going to generate a lot of a lot of negative noise, and it didn't. And uh, and that's you know I think that's a, a positive thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It was all right. No, no. I I think it's because you stuck to facts. Okay, you just stuck to facts. You didn't uh, call any one individual out. I mean, 
I, I watched the uh, presentation last night over dinner, and Matt, I thought that was a great presentation. Well, thank in, you. in fact, uh, no, because really, I thought it would be a lot more controversial than what you know than what it turned out to be because you know you just uh, stuck to the facts and you know let the research work speak for itself because you know my takeaways uh, from that presentation uh, over by the way to me a literally a one inch thick grandma style sicilian pizza <laughs> oh yeah anyway oh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> my yeah. takeaways were is, is that in most cases, humic neither hurts nor helps. But if you go over a certain threshold, it starts to have negative effect on the actual growth and performance of the turf grass. Yeah, and I think in certain instances, I don't know if that's been realized across all turf grasses um, and individual cultivars and stuff. There's a lot... I still think there's a lot of unknown, right? And, mm -hmm. but I think that at least as far as the claims that are out there regarding what it does, I think that has pretty much conclusively de been deduced that it doesn't necessarily do all of those things all the time to all turf types. Um, and you see the, the bizarre intricacies of like perennial ryegrass that increase rates, all of a sudden weird things start happening. Uh, bizarre interactions with phosphorus, unpredictable interactions with phosphorus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny, you get into agriculture and you research humic acid and phosphorus uptake, you're going to find, you know, 20, 30 studies on it. And then you dial in to what the humic material is and it's all low pH humic material, right? Which is not humic material. It's, it's not, it's not going to stay That's solid. That's fulvic. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so I think there's, uh, it, it you know, and like how I summarize, I think there's no denying there's biological activity taking place. I just don't think um, the predictability of it, as far as what we know about it right now, and the ROI is necessarily there. But I'd still even think that's up for debate uh, based on, you know, are you forced into a situation where you have to run lower input, lower nitrogen programs or whatever the case may be. So I try to give a, at least a a balanced negative and positive viewpoint on it, right? I thought it was fair. I mean, I thought that, uh, you know, I'm sure that people will watch this and say that we're fanboying out and that we're, we're just a bunch of sellouts and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? Like, it, I think the reason that we all, you know, hang out and talk and everything like that is the fact that I think we've said it many, many, many times that, we all don't follow the same paradigm. There's a lot of there's a lot of places where we do align agronomically, but there's also a lot of places that we don't. And I think when it comes down to evaluating products and things like that, it's always going to be, hey, okay, there's always the side of research that can tell us as much as is possible, right, about a specific product. And the deeper you dive, and Matt probably found this, the deeper you dive, the less you're sure, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. Like, there is no cut and dry in science. Like, it just, it just doesn't happen. There's too many variables. There's too many situations that this could or could not work. And within that, I think what's happened here on the other side of this, you know, from a marketing standpoint, is that all the positives that have come from these studies have been taken and extrapolated way further, much further than they ever should have been, right? And so if you want to use it, by all means, you know, I thought the warning at the, at the beginning, beginning, the, uh, the trigger warning was perfectly sound, perfectly just. If you don't care what you spend on your product, if you don't really care about, you know, if they work or if they don't, and it just makes you feel good to put it out, then by all means, man, go for it. You know, that's what we say, you know, where we used to say that in the golf course, you know, if it makes you feel better and sleep better at night, ain't nobody going to be mad at you. Right. Except mm -hmm. for GM. Right. And you're and you're and you're called accountant, but hey, whatever. Those you know, it's only money, right? That's well, right. It's it's only money, and it's not your money. And so you're walking on thin ice. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. <laughs> well, let's let's go ahead and jump into today's yeah. headlines, uh, and we'll start with uh, number one here. No. Oh. Fear here. The 
This is just the garage. I'm off my rocker, boys. I went I went kind of hard in the paint this morning, and yeah. uh, so bear with me. I'm, so, I'm all that I'm Tabasco to sauce that's coursing through your veins right now. <laughs> <laughs> Until you've eaten a half a bottle of Tabasco sauce, I don't want to hear anybody's input on how well I'm handling oh, it. Oh, I do, not. Frank. I'll do Frank's Red Hot. I'll do a half a bottle of Frank's Red Hot Tabasco. It's man. good, um, isn't it? Frank's, I can uh, eat Frank's on well, anything. Go on, go on. All right, so the headline here is no barley, no beer, and the barley crop, crop is really struggling in 2021. And, uh, and so this is kind of a crossover. I saw a reference to it in um, uh, the Smithsonian Magazine, and then it, it kind of moved over here to this uh, uh, Magic Valley here. And... So is that a what, where's Twin Falls? Is that Minnesota? Idaho. It sure sounds like it. Idaho. Idaho. I have no idea Idaho. where it is, but I know it's somewhere out, not around where I am. Uh, terrible. Yeah, That's get- the word Larry Holifield, Holifield uses to describe the 2021 barley growing season. We never caught a break. Early rain and high heat at the maturing time means this farm is uh, facing an estimated 13 percent decrease in yield from the 2020 season. Barley production is forecasted to be down 36% from 2020, according to the USDA. In my 20 years, no, I've never seen this. I'd say we are fairly steady. You have those slight 1% to 2% swings, but nothing this drastic. Idaho is the top barley producing state in the United States, and last year farmers had record yields of 110 bushels per acre. The state produced 55 million bushels of barley, accounting for 33% of the nation's barley crop. And this ain't it this year. Gentlemen, losing 36% of your typical barley yield, that is a lot. That's over one-third of the barley that is typically available in the United States is has evaporated to the powers that be to the good Lord, to whoever stepped in and took it from us. It is gone, gentlemen. I'm not a big barley uh, beer drinker, Consumer. I guess. Yeah. Unless it's in some gra- of the whiskeys I drink. Do you eat grape nuts or anything? I mean, come on, man. You know? Uh, no. Come Hell on. no, I don't eat grape nuts. Have you lost your mind? Oh, oh I eat grape Do nuts. Do I look I like a them. squirrel to you? <laughs> Do I look like one? Apparently. <laughs> well, you know, we were talking about nuts here before the show, so maybe I am. Hmm. <laughs> Anyhow. Too much nutscape. This, uh, <laughs> see how we tied that all back together? It only took us like 10 minutes to do that, too. That was good. That was good. Um, you know, again, we're seeing this with the grass seed, right? Pacific Northwest is taking, taking a brunt of this. And then, you know, we're seeing this a lot in uh, the Corn Belt, you know, the central United States, the Midwest, the Plains where you know they're having some tough tough summers you know so uh, whether you want to call it climate change global warming whatever the case is just just you know sort of an anomaly in the weather here as of late i don't know but i'm gonna tell you that the you know the the issues that we're facing is that a lot of this stuff like what you were just saying what was it 55 is it 55 percent or 55 million bushels that they produce in Idaho every year, Matt. What was it? I'm sorry, I missed it in the article. Yeah, the state produces 55 million bushels of barley, which accounts for a third of the nation's barley crop in Idaho. That's a lot of Keystone, Denis. That's a lot of Keystone. (laughs) And that's what I mean. It's like you get these places where, hey, if everything's going right, you're going to get a bumper crop, right? You're going to have a great year. But you miss, right? This is what's going to happen. And so I don't know. I don't know. There, there's, you know, talk of, um, not talk of, but they're using a lot more genetically modified crops now. And I wonder, you know, how much of that now the focus is going to be on uh, drought resistance and heat stress and things like that. Because Lord knows, like, this ain't going to quit. I mean, it's not going to go away to the extent that you're going to have to have something in the toolbox, right? And there's nothing you can spray. There's nothing you can do, right? All you can do is work on the genetics of the crop. And fortunately, fortunately, we know how to do that. But how long will that take? And where does this all kind of buffer out? Bottom line is, you know, whether you're eating grape nuts or drinking Keystone, it's going to cost you more, just like grass seed, just like all these other crops, right? So I didn't realize grape was... nuts was a cereal. Are you serious? 
I had, I had no idea. I thought it was a legit nut you go to the store and get. And I was like, oh, they're actually barley grains. They call grape nuts. That's weird. I, it's, it's, it's a weird it's a thing. cereal. I don't, I don't know. It's got to be a northern that. thing. I have never even seen this box before. Seriously? You've never? I'm never. dead serious. I've never seen this box before. Let's, you don't like growing grocery shopping, though. So, absolutely not. not a, <laughs> well, I do not. I do this not is want a, to be around those people, Demay. You know what I'm saying? Well, listen, I live. I live out in me, the country. <laughs> I'm not being around those people. Cheryl, you go no, down there, we, there to Publix. You'll get me some of them grape nuts. I'm gonna snack on them grape nuts. Mm. Let me hit that yeah. pot before I go. Yeah, let me. Let yeah, me, let me because put some Tabasco uh, in there. <laughs> yeah, because grape nuts. I didn't know that. Grape nuts were was from barley because uh unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, my idea of breakfast is buttermilk biscuits. Oh yeah. Look, no Ray, buttermilk Ray biscuits. Is, Ray is as redneck as they come. I don't care what anybody says. What what about what about like red eye gravy and stuff like that, Ray? Do you do, you do like a real Ooh, like, I I would. I would. Yeah. I totally would. Red eye, red eye gravy. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Like I mean, uh... <laughs> I just like how Ray is on that Michael Phelps Olympic diet and is still like a buck ten soaking wet. That's my favorite <laughs> thing about it. Ray, what did you eat today? Oh, I ate about thirteen thousand calories. Although he is on that whole, uh, you know, backpack sprayer diet weight loss plan. So <laughs> that all. <laughs> <what I'm doing. laughs> nope. <laughs> Ate that ribeye you know, for my birthday dinner. Better go out and spray three acres of greens tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> to kind of continue on with this, not only is yeah. Idaho down, Montana yeah. is 54% down. North Dakota is 37% down from last year. Oh, These are not good oh. numbers. This is really bad. So first, we already take off the rising cost of, of inputs, right? Well, Or we add that to the occasion. Rising cost of inputs. Um, you know, it's going to cost you more to grow your crop. Mm -hmm. You're getting lower <laughs> yields because you don't have the water. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a trifecta. And then where does the majority of the barley go? Not to grape nuts or Kellogg's or post whoever's making this. It goes to the damn animals, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of impact is this going to have downstream as we start moving into, uh, uh next year with, you know, livestock costs, uh, you, you know, or, or, or meat costs, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be extreme. And I 100% hate to see it, but, you know, when you're at the mercy of the weather, regardless of the species animal you're dealing with here, um, you know, we're all dependent on Mother Nature, whether we want to be or not. We'll move on to the next one here. The 20, this is fascinating. The 2021 nitrogen loss in Missouri cornfields. Uh, Demay, I think you brought this up, and this is, uh, a fantastic one. And basically, just to kind of highlight some uh, some information in this, it started out relatively dry in the spring, which is great for nitrogen. Uh, and then it became really wet, and then it became really hot. And hot, wet weather, and when it comes to nitrogen volatility, is a, uh, a notoriously uh, risky thing. And so what they have started to observe at this point is earlier than expected nitrogen deficiencies within the plant. Not only, not only are we suffering from uh, 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 not enough rain, here we're looking at yield loss because of too much rain. You can't win for one way or the other. It's almost like you need an even keel balance of both there. Well, and I think, too, this is where, you know... Uh, timing right you know they talked about early planted crops and how those were impacted more right number one number two i i don't know corn growers in missouri well enough to tell you what kind of nitrogen sources they're using other than you know this is one where uh, in particular the uh nbpt and the dcd this is these are this is a good opportunity to talk about this subject right both in agriculture and in turf right and how those can be good tools to use, especially if you're on any, I mean, this is in agriculture, you know, completely unirrigated, you're just relying on the weather. And yeah, they got absolutely slammed, right? In that May timeframe, going into June, I think. 
down in that area, like tons and tons and tons of rain. And so mm-hmm. that's one where, you know, if we're, if we're going to relate this back to turf, you know, which I think most of our audience is, is probably wondering, okay, well, who cares about corn in Missouri and nitrogen and all that kind of stuff. We go through this in a microcosm, right? Like every rain event or every, you know, every summer, if you want to take it in a, in a bigger chunk in the sense of that nitrogen management is probably the most crucial thing that you're going to do besides watering and mowing from May one until October one on cool season grass, right? Like that's the most critical thing that you're going to have to worry about besides just the absolute basics. And so Ray, why don't you give everybody a, a quick primer on, you know, what can you do to stem the tide here? Right? So NBPT, what is it? And DCD, what is it? And how do those two work either individually or how do they complement one another if they're mixed together? Okay. What those two components do is basically they keep urea from rapidly converting to ammonia in the soil and it'll stop that rapid conversion of urea to ammonia even in the face of hot and wet weather so you know i use a lot of uh, what they call umax which is soluble urea with a very heavy dose of you know dcd and uh, that uh, npdd compound and my reason for doing that is so that I go out and apply my nitrogen and say I'm out of luck, Ryan, and it rains like hell next week. I don't lose my application. It just keeps on working. And here's the difference between non-stabilized urea and stabilized urea, to just put it you know, into turf grass terms. Non-stabilized urea, grass grows, grows like a son of a bitch for the first two to three weeks after you apply your urea and then it just drops off dead. But with stabilized urea, like your your Umex product, you're then looking at grass that might not kick in surge growth green for the first week or two, but you then can look at six to eight weeks of actual nitrogen response out of that urea application. And this is from that coat, that non-coated, non-polymerized, non-SCU urea that's fully soluble, able to distribute itself in the soil. And you're getting six to eight weeks out of that single application. How's about that? <laughs> Well, it's pretty good, and I think that's the one thing is people, a lot of people rely or have relied on, you know, polymer coats, wax coats, resins, all that kind of stuff, right, to stem the tide, but that's all based on moisture, right? So if we have an ass mm-hmm. load of moisture, well, we're going to not be in control of that response, right? Same thing with my, my very favorite slow-release uh, nitrogen source of all time, methylene urea. You know, if we get hot and wet together, you're going to see a big-time release of that. It's not going to follow it's the gonna... curve of what mm-hmm. you see on that printed bag or the cell sheet or the cut sheet or whatever. So, Matt, I'm curious on your your end from a fertilizer blending standpoint, you know, if you were going to design the perfect product, you know, is NBPT and DCD are those two components, right? Because we're using NBPT to not volatilize and we're using DCD to slow down the conversion of urea into ammonia, which is also ultimately going to be taken up into the plant and used as available nitrogen so are those really the two tickets in the hot and what together times or you know other than just being uh, you know taking a full spoon feeding approach with just urea or just ammonium sulfate what's your take on trying to stem these losses in a turf system or even in agriculture yeah it's it is one of the more effective tools we have right and i don't think i don't think it's wise to go with just MBPT. I don't think it's wise to just go with DCD. Uh, there's, mm-hmm. there's definitely some mm-hmm. synergy there with, with those two coming together. And 
especially if you're trying to manage your cost, right? Because, you know, some of the things you can do is always go with a thicker plastic coating, right? You know, so you can move into your duration 120s or, um, you know, whatever they coat with like Osmoco, where they're actually using like paraffin in combination with mm -hmm. it. Um, and then there are some other slow release coating technologies that are also plastics as, as well. Like for instance, the, um, Oh, who is it out of uh, Knox, Indiana? They do their vinyl coating. They have a, a particular type of vinyl that they use as a as a slow release wrapper. And you know that's supposed to be more temperature based rather than moisture based. But you know it's one of those things. If you're hot and wet, you're not really protected from any of it, right? So, um, as as one of the uh, ways of of trying to balance and manage that release curve, I really think stabilized nitrogen is is pretty good now. What I would like to see is uh, Coke, for example, has come out with some new products that have not made it to turf, right? And so we have uh, Centuro as one. Uh, let's see, Anvil is another one. And, I, you know, as a manufacturer, I tried to buy these, uh, but they would not allow it to be sold to be uh, sold to a manufacturer to be put into uh, turf grass, right? They kind of guard that very, very aggressively. But... I think there's some more technology left on that space that's yet to come to the industry for whatever reason. I don't know, you know, it could be patents or whatever the case may be, but I think it's out there. It hasn't made it yet. And this whole nitrogen stabilization thing actually started with what was once used as a pesticide, if I recall correctly, and that was calcium cyanamide, uh, which was the precursor to dicyanamide. Did I get that right, Ray? Wasn't calcium cyanamide originally thought to be a, uh, a pesticide? Actually, calcium cyanamide is, and it still is an extremely effective fumigant against certain diseases and weeds. Uh, it's just that, you know, the climate right now does not favor fumigants because I would gladly broadcast calcium cyanamide and then cover the entire area with a plastic sheet during renovation, I gladly do it. And say I do that in an acidic soil that's calcium deficient, you talk about taking care of two things at once at a good price, you know, dealing with my pests and adding calcium to calcium deficient soil. I mean, that's, that's a talk about a win win. It is. And, you know, you, we don't see it here in the States anymore. I still see it in Europe from time to time on old labels, specifically on uh, grub control labels. I'll see calcium cyanamide labels. Um, but it, it, that was, you know, one of the first things that was discovered as having uh, stabilatory effects for nitrogen. And then it became DCD. I don't know if that's due to ease of manufacturing or whatever the case may be. But uh, Stability, product kind of stability, Matt. Product stability, product stability because DC, DCD is less likely to break down into non-stable products because I got to look this up later, but I believe that cyanamide, of course, given the name, readily breaks down into ammonia and cyanide, and that's why it does what it does. You know, it's literally gassing things in the soil because in Europe, popular use of this is on fields to be planted to cabbage and potatoes because the calcium cyanamide is such an effective fumigant for the soil-borne diseases. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know, you want to talk about going down a real weird wormhole is the uh, or the the efficacy metrics for uh, arsenic and uh, cyanide and the uh, role they play in agriculture. It's very bizarre, <laughs> and you know, people will think you're crazy, but you know, there's research out there that shows you know t fractions of amounts of arsenic and cyanide actually increase plant vigor and germination rates and all these fun stuff too. And, Obviously, we don't like to talk about it because you want to talk about an ecological disaster, but it's there's some, some <laughs> factual basis there. We'll move on to the next one here. The EPA takes action to address risk from chlorpyrifos and protect children's health. 
the protect children's health thing, I think, is part of trying to scare everybody again, right? But I don't want to dilute the fact that um, Durspan, which is chlorpyrifos, is is a is a toxic substance. There's no doubt about it. It requires very extreme. You have to be extremely careful with it. It's not something to just play around with. Uh, it's old. It's been around forever. And it's one of those that, you know, you could do your perimeter pest with it. And it was a phenomenal product. Uh, it stunk to, it stunk like hell. Um, but I, you know, this idea of protecting children's health. It, yeah. All right. Yes, it does. And you know, they go into more detail. The EPA does about, um, the developmental symptoms that children ended up facing from it. Um, so I don't know, maybe it does need to be in the title. Maybe I'm, I'm the one who's, who's, you know, being too sensitive about it. What, what y'all's take on, on Clopyrifos and Durzban? It's a, it's a heavy hitter. I mean, it's, it's right for the chopping block and you know, this, the Ray, this is how it goes, right? That, you know, if there was a, uh, F, FBI 10 most wanted list for, you know, active ingredients that needed to go, it's on it like at number one don't you think i uh, actually i i think so because uh in another time uh i remember being at odds with consumers because i literally remember working with one customer who had seen augustine and guess how this this old man screwed me up he kept on going down to the hardware store, buying bags of Durspan 1G, which, by the way, was sold to consumers in the 1990s. And he'd broadcast that every month on his St. Augustine. So by the time you know, it was my turn, I had southern cinch bugs in that lawn that were basically like, uh, mutants they no longer responded to chlorpyrifos so that that's, that's my take on it but, but then that's not a, to continue not a this, thing. not a good thing no it was horrible matt because if not for resistance to chlorpyrifos that was literally what triggered me to start playing around with something that's probably four times as toxic as chlorpyrifos, which would be turcam or bendeocarb. That's what caused it. Just because of that guy, you know, creating mutant cinch bugs here in Hawaii. Now, Ray, so... I know you like to talk about health effects from these types of things. I know that's something you study very aggressively. Um, mm -hmm. As far as what they say in this particular article, uh, article here, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, uh, skim through this, but uh, basically, they say it causes, uh, well, first off, the, the rates that have been sprayed uh, agriculturally for now are leaving pesticide residues beyond what is considered safe. Um, and then the implications are, are that um, there has been developmental issues in kids. What is it about Durzban that is causing the developmental issues of the kin, uh, of kids? Is it because it's an organophosphate and they're suffering from organophosphate symptoms or is there a particular issue with like a manufacturing side effect like we saw with 245T? Do you know what it is specifically? Okay. What the effect is, is that the EPA is keen in on low-level cholinesterase inhibition. And it's not to the point where the cholinesterase inhibition uh, creates the physical symptoms that I described on one of your shows very uh, graphically. It's more to the point that there may be subtle effects regarding the development and you know basically learning capability of children because you modify cholinesterase in the brain and you affect things like behavior, learning, and memory. Okay? So in other words, 
Uh, what the EPA is specifically thinking about is what if low level chlorpyrifos contamination and organophosphate contamination of our you know food chain in general is why we have so many children that are ADHD or autistic because that low level cholinesterase inhibition in their brain is causing those developmental issues however uh I want to see the experience of Australia and New Zealand because those two countries, oh, and South Africa, because those three countries I know specifically are not making moves towards banning or restricting organophosphates further. That's interesting. No, it Australia, interesting. you know doesn't i mean did you know that you can still get diazinon for turf in australia no that's shocking to me um and i know or, they still or chlorpyrifos use, or or you know i know msma is still there dmsa is still there too mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i don't know it's it's kind of interesting do you have anything else on it on it ryan you want to chime in about did you did you use a lot of durspan at one time No, I can remember being 19 years old in a golf course in Pennsylvania and uh, going out there at night, Ray, and taking care of some problems with some <laughs> Durzban, right? Um, wow. Not, not, fully, not fully suited up with Tyvek, but respirator and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, you, you know, you go in and even at my previous employer, we had to do uh, – blood testing every six months even though we weren't spraying any organophosphates but they still wanted to monitor us because in the past right you know some previous employees you know way 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 back and then for us that had done it over the years right you know they were looking for the latency in that showing up and so again you know for the folks at home we keep talking about cholinesterase that's the enzyme right that triggers the synapses in between your nerves to send messages to and from your brain, right? So um, right. kind of important, right? And so what these organophosphates do is over time they build up in your bloodstream and they can inhibit, right, that enzyme to the extent that it can cause developmental delays, it can cause uh, birth defects, it can cause a, a number of maladies, right, that um, are not good. And so... You know, you look at what's coming down the pike, and I think this is yeah, the big picture here, Matt. This is what I see is what is the speed at which they're going to get rid of the old stuff that really in in hindsight probably needs to go? And how is that going to match up with the speed at which they're bringing new products into the pipeline and getting them into the turf market? Not the ag market, but into the turf market. And I think that's the pinch that we're going to be caught in here these next 10 15 years is is it going to be fast enough you know are we going to pull back enough on the old stuff that needs to go and push hard enough forward on the stuff that needs to come i don't know i don't know that's Ask the guys that were spraying nemacure right and where they ended up for about eight ten years mm -hmm. Actually, and that's something not a lot of people guys, know is yeah. you know th this ask time the, uh, mm -hmm. uh 15 years ago lawn care guys were getting blood tests uh, because of exposure to pesticides. And, uh, and so they, they monitor that and that's, that's not often talked about. That's one of those, one of those old tales, you know, that, that gets lost in the wayside. And so for everybody listening right now, that's worried about what they're doing, no shit. We used to have to get blood tested. And, uh, and so, yeah, kind of an interesting thing. They were phasing that out and the active ingredients that required it when I was at, at True Green actually. So, uh, that's some, some old dinosaur data there, Ryan. Thanks for bringing that up. Wow. Yeah. I'm old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's school. my similar experience. Yeah. That's my similar experience as well, because, and you, you know, Ryan, you speak to the gap. Uh, I was in an even bigger gap because, you know, when they pulled diazinon 4E, 
-hmm. I was in such heartache because I, I was in bad trouble because when did fluo pyram be, become available to the turf grass market i couldn't even tell you i'll be honest with yeah. you okay it was it was i think back in 2016 or 2000 2017 holy smokes. but so that's that's almost yeah what almost 20 years almost 20 years or... yeah and and it was almost 20 years when uh i had to tell people where okay your grass is gonna die uh i can try fertilizing it more i can try watering it more but your grass is gonna die all i can think of is ray's bedside manner as a as a uh, attending physician yeah he's gonna die i mean we'll try to make him comfortable <laughs> but i don't know i mean it could be quick he probably he probably will feel the, all the pain i mean it's pretty sure Look. He's going to feel all We got to bring up death again. We can't get through an episode without bringing up death. Uh, <laughs> speaking, speaking of death, we're way long on this, but let's go ahead and move through uh, this this last one here. Uh, firms line this up green ammonia fertilizer and future fuel. Uh, so a couple of large companies here, both out of Norway, have teamed up together. One we all know very well, and that is Yara. Uh, Yara mm -hmm. has uh, teamed up with uh, Statcraft, and they have formed a new joint venture called Hegra. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Yeah, Statcraft, Acre Clean Hydrogen, and fertilizer specialist Yara have launched a company focused on the production of so-called green ammonia. And this new joint venture is called Hegra. And what they are going to be doing is producing uh, ammonia mm -hmm. with renewable energy. They feel like they can get that done. Kudos to them. That's that's great. I think that's awesome. And uh, I would love to see what the economic impact, I would love to see what the environmental impact is, that uh, that actually gives us on the front end leading up to the production of ammonia, right? Like, I want to see what the environmental True. impact is prior to getting to the ammonia plant. Shh, shh don't worry about that part, right? I, that wasn't in the pitch important. deck. That wasn't, it's important. That like, wasn't in the pitch it, deck. Wasn't in the listen, pitch it's deck. the Don't same argument with biochar, right? It's the same argument with yeah. biochar. Sure. What is the environmental cost of harvesting the wood, breaking the wood down into chips, drying the wood to get to a certain spot in order to go through the pyrolysis? What do you do with all the waste gases, the wood vinegar, the pyroligneous acid, all the, the benzenes and everything that comes from the gas stream of pyrolysis. Where does that fit into the picture? Yes, if you take that and you put it into the soil and it increases the carbon capture rate of the soil, that's great. That's awesome. And I'm a huge fan of that. And I think, but it, are we being disingenuous by ignoring what happens upstream of it? It's all I'm saying. And I wonder the same thing here. I know it wasn't probably on the pitch deck, but I think it, I think it should be explored. Dude, this is all Pandora's box, okay? Like, we, we were having a discussion about that, you and I, earlier this weekend, about, you know, people that really genuinely want to do good, right? And I think the conversation you and I had centered around, you know, 25B, uh, limited risk pesticides. And, you know, does going out in, you know, this is, this is kind of a, a far cry here, but a little bit kind of tied in, but... You know, going out and nuking something with a whole bunch of ferrous sulfate and saying, hey, man, I got that weed. Well, yeah, and then what's going to be in that spot, right, for, you know, what's what's happening to all the, you know, people always want to talk about the microbiome, right, or the microflora and all that kind of stuff. What's happening to that that just got, you know, like a 50x rate of anything that would be normal for turf? And so that whole thing and then... I, I I don't know. It's it's like where do you where do you stop? That's really the question you've got to ask yourself. Is where do you stop your, yourself from asking questions of, well, where did that come from? How did that get here? How did we get that raw material or this part of the product into our stream? Right? And there's a certain point where you just have to earmuffs, plug your ears, and stop thinking about it. And it's. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I don't think, I, I think you're right. I'm just saying that 
it just doesn't exist. What you're what you're talking about is utopia. It's a unicorn. It doesn't exist. It probably is. It probably is. I think there should be some Unless, transparency around it because I think that transparency will inspire more people to try and solve that problem of the upstream wastes and uh, the environmental cost to, to be able to do that. So trying to act like it doesn't exist and keep it under the rug and then every time it surfaces, you know, you beat it back into submission is, I don't know. I, I, I think it's disingenuous, but I'm weird. Ray, you know what I think we need to do? I think what we need to do to make this all work out is harvest a big giant piece of leonardite out of New Mexico or North Dakota, <laughs> improve Matt Wright. We fly it out <laughs> over wherever you want with a helicopter, and we just stuff a whole bunch of C4 down there, and we just explode it out. And whatever happens, happens, man. That's the best we can do. Yep. Helicopter fuel and C4. That's all we expended. Is a in this. C4 okay. explosion? Is does that generate a high pH or a low pH? Because you know we <laughs> we know that really what we're looking for is. Uh, where is a happy age? Where's Robert Palmer when we need him? Where is Robert Palmer? That's right. Yeah, we do. We yeah. need, it. We need mean, a bomb. We we need technician. an EOD. We need an EOD man. We need an EOD yeah. man on the, on this one. <laughs> but you know, I always look at any kind of environmental initiative in terms of what is the actual energy cost. You know, what does this cost us in terms of resources to do this i mean because a lot of people can you know say green this green that but what is your actual cost you know i i mean i i, I think about that all the time and uh i know one of my colleagues uh sent me this uh slide set one day talking about you know my favorite subject green weed control in right of ways and it was rather eye opening and shocking to me because all of these alternative methods of weed vegetation management actually had a higher environmental impact than just spraying the damn thing <laughs> Well, that's like I mean, no, doing a paint. vinegar burn down. Uh, yeah. Really? A vinegar oh. burn down for the kudzu to end up taking over everything anyway? You know, you, you take the leaves off of it, but, you know, are you going to be able to reply it every week? You know, 300 and, you know, 52 weeks a year? Or eventually, yeah. is you, are you limited to three applications? And every time you go out there, you've got, you know, 300 yards of new area of, of kudzu that have taken over an area. <laughs> Ryan, I don't know if you have to deal with kudzu, but no, um, I was actually showing J-Pink oh, today when we, were, when we were driving through. And, you know, what's interesting about kudzu is that I think it's capable of growing up to like 14 inches a day or something. And, you know, we'll see uh, 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 neighborhoods, parking lots, uh, tractors, cars, trucks, trees, completely consumed by kudzu, where there, there's nothing left. It is it has become a blanket of kudzu, and you know it gets on know, to the to the sides of the roads. You know, and, and driving through Mississippi, especially, I'll tell you guys that it's it literally takes over everything on the side of the road. It's unbelievable. But I know kudzu's Achilles' it. heel. Yeah, I know I know kudzu's Achilles' heel, and I consider it a fairly low impact type of an application actually ryan Play it on eight me. ounces per acre clopyrrolid oh man Montreal. Mm. I'll, I'll tell you what you can clean up the shit out of some vining stuff with and clover i'm talking yeah well clover too clover i mean here's here's the nice thing about clopyrrolid well Let's talk about the two nice things and let's talk about the two bad things, right? Uh, the, mm -hmm. the first nice thing, anything vining, it will absolutely f and torch. Like smoke go it. out there, It'll and smoke it. What po poison ivy that's got, you know, um, stalks going up a tree that are thicker than my dong. Like it'll take it out no problem, right? <laughs> the other nice thing is that same product. I can take that same exact product. And I can put it out at a quarter ounce per thousand, and I can spray bent grass mode at a quarter inch 
with no Fido and knock out Clover or just about a lot of other uh, broadleaf weeds. Those are the good things. Now let's talk about the bad things, Ray. Number one, it ain't labeled for residential. And Ray, why don't you fill people in on why it's not labeled for residential? Here's number two, boys and girls. Okay, the reason why Clopirulid is not labeled for residential turf is because it is such a long-lasting herbicide that it will transfer itself into the grass, and the grass clippings from an area treated with clopyrrolid will actually be toxic to flowers, lettuce, or tomatoes that are subsequently planted into soil containing those clopyrrolid treated grass clippings. However, I have to bring up one good thing about clopyrrolid. One more good thing, Ryan. Okay, let's hear Compared it. Compared to something like, say, 2,4-D or triclopyr, mm -hmm. most hardwoods and conifers, mm -hmm. as well as woody and herbaceous shrubs that are not legumes or polygoniums or asters, are extremely tolerant of clopyrrolid. You can hose down poison ivy or kudzu that's growing in, say, a pine forest, and the pines will ignore the application. The vines are, of course, on the ground choking in a month, and you've done a good thing. Now, it's I'm, extremely I'm what, selective. Matt, Matt always gets to tell these cool stories of, of questionable applications he's made. <laughs> I, myself, haven't made that many questionable applications. However... I can distinctly remember with a JD9 blasting the ever-living shit out of uh, poison ivy that was 30 feet up a tree, 10 feet away from some homeowner's house on the golf course. And they're like, are you getting rid of all that poison ivy? Are you going to get rid of it? I'm like, ma'am, you're going to want to go back inside, like right now. Like, get inside. <laughs> take, the kid, take the dog. And good. Don't come back out here go for back like here. eight hours. And also, by mm -hmm. the way, if you, if you don't mind, could you not bag your grass and, and, and compost your clippings, please? Because it's against the law. Shh. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Moving on. With the JD night. <laughs> All right, y'all. This week, our show is brought to you by Hone Health. Honehealth.com forward slash the grass factor for 45 bucks. Get out there. Get your shit tested and find out what's going on inside of you. It's a super easy thing. It's super simple. It's painless. Unless you are like J Pink and you faint every time a needle even comes in your vicinity. Uh, but it's not even an exposed needle. You prick your finger, you drop your blood on a card, and you send it in. And you know what they tell you? They tell you, I, that was not going to be a good joke that I was going to insert there. That was, it was not going to be funny. Um, it was funny, but it probably wasn't appropriate for this type of scenario. But you know what they will tell you? They'll, they'll look at your hormone levels and they'll say, listen, you're either good, you're either not good. And, uh, and if you're not good, then you've got a whole range of options on how to handle it, right? Because Hone Health is all about hormone optimization. It's about you becoming the absolute best man you could possibly be. HoneHealth.com forward slash grass factor. All right, we're going to move into this week's Burns. That was Ryan making his old lady talk Thank over the weekend. Me. There, that was that. Was that after the conversation y'all had about clopyrrolid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was throwing up gang signs with her toes. It was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> World's worst invasive weed sold at many U.S. garden centers. Uh, banned by federal and state regulators, many invasive plants are still being sold at garden centers, nurseries, and online retailers nationwide. In this particular instance, coggin grass, uh, labeled as one of the world's worst invasive weeds by the Whoa. USDA and banned by federal uh, legislation is being found all over the place. Even though it's banned by all these places in the federal noxious weed act and, and just insert here, coggin grass is all over the place. Coggin grass, however you want to pronounce it, but you pick your poison. Cause I don't know. Other invasive species being sold is Japanese berry, Chinese privet, white top, Norway, mepel, Brazil, uh, Norway maple, Brazilian pepper tree, Russian olive, garlic mustard, yellow star thistle, Canada thistle, kudzu, Johnson grass, among others, the study states. 
Research report the proliferation of these plants continues to uh, due to an inconsistent approach of uh, by of enforcement by federal and state regulators. However, the study concludes that consumers need to be more aware of what they're buying as well. Oh, listen, well, gentlemen, okay. oh. let me tell you why this does not shock me at all. And uh, aren't Bradford pears on the list uh, somewhere as well too as being considered In uh, invasive? You know where you got you you know where the biggest uh, exporter of of Bradford pears is right now. Take a guess. Tennessee or Georgia? In the states. Tennessee. Yeah. Going at, going down there gets the red dirt. Yeah, they're all in in Middle Tennessee. Golly, what is the name of that town? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where it is. Uh, what there is a McMinnville, Tennessee burn is a huge nursery production uh, part of the state, right? And there, I mean, it's mm -hmm. so unbelievable. You could take one road and you're going to go past 40 nurseries, huge nurseries, really? right? That only do wholesale. Yeah. You can't walk in Why? and buy anything. I don't know. What's, what's the, what's it about? Is it the soil? Is it like, what's, I don't, I don't... no, I think, it, I think they, the, uh, uh, the local government encouraged it at one point when something else failed, it may have been an old tobacco mm. uh, farming area. And then, you know, as part of like some sort of in, uh, economic impact stimulus or whatever they were doing. Uh, it got rolled into um, uh, nursery production. Well, and McMinnville, Tennessee is like one of the largest nursery producing towns in all of America. Um, oh, shit. Here's the thing. While there are good nursery nurseries out there, there are also bad nurseries. Like you see some nurseries that do air pruning and all this fun stuff to make sure that when you get a plant and you put it in the ground, you have a very high probability of success. You've got other nurseries you unpot it and you see the most insane root system and you cut it back, right? You cut it back to the previous pot. So you got a five gallon, you cut it back to a three gallon. It's just as girdled as it was at the five gallon. You cut it back to a one gallon and it's just as girdled as it, as it was at the five gallon. You see it all the time. Is it shocking that there are people out there selling plants they shouldn't be selling? It's not to me, but I think this falls on to, um, you, Okay. The way we get enforced in lawn care, which I will say has been laxed over the last six years or so, it is, it's nowhere near as extreme as it was when I first started. Uh, hmm. And it, I would say it never was quite extreme, um, but it has sure. laxed a little bit. And I think the same thing's falling on, on the, the, the nursery side. Because, look, you want to pass an inspection, get to know your inspector real well on a personal level. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to come, they're going to look at one sheet of paper from you and they're going to move on because they've got to cover 13 other counties. Yeah, and it, it, it allows and things I, like this to happen. Well, and, and a lot of times here, I mean, I, I don't know, Ray, what it's like in Hawaii and it's certainly a lot different story because of imports, exports, all that stuff, stuff that's coming on the island and leaving the island. But here, at least, you know, I can say that for a fact that Unless you've created a problem or been reported for a problem, they're not going to hassle you, right? They will come and do their inspection, which is usually every two or three years. And I'm sure that, you know, nurseries and uh, other retail locations, right, are the same way, right, for them to go out and inspect those. And so, but if there's not a complaint anywhere in there, well, they ain't going to go see you. And... A lot of times, right? Like if I go to a big box or even a garden center, sometimes I don't know where the stuff's coming from, right? There could be, you know, we could have even more than one grower for a particular uh, crop that was being sold in a nursery. And so I get it. I understand, you know, the plight that they're in, right? Is state and local regulators, right? Or even federal. But what, you know, if I'm a nursery, right? And if I'm operating right at wholesale, I'm I'm saying, hey, I'll take that risk all day long, and if you catch me, you catch me, right? It's just that's the nature of the beast. It's just it's you're just you're you're playing the numbers. Yeah, you are, and uh, in my case, uh, I know stuff doesn't move between islands. Stuff doesn't come into Hawaii. Stuff doesn't leave Hawaii without being checked with the equivalent of an anal probe 
because the fear is is some kind of crap hitching the boat to California or say something terrible. And by the way, the reason why they're you know basically on uh, you know alert level ten is because we already have tests on one island making their way over to the other islands and creating ecological disaster. But uh, here's where I think it is like we are nowhere near where we need to be because I would wish for Hawaii to be like Australia. Do you know why I'm saying that, Matt? No. It's because... Nothing plant-based enters Australia without getting gassed. And when I'm talking well, gassed, I'm talking about a vacuum a chamber these, with the good old MB. <laughs> some of these are native. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the good old MB. <laughs> uh, some of these are, well, maybe not. I guess the Japanese barberry, the Chinese privet, Norway maple. Brazilian pepper tree, a Russian olive, Canada thistle. They're import the damn Canadians importing their thistle. Unbelievable. <laughs> I don't know how it survives down south, but we get it every winter down here as well, too. Um, yeah, and and honestly, you know, while this article does say that uh, the the buyer needs to be more informed, which I one hundred percent agree to. Uh, I think there needs to be inner policing in the the nursery industry as well. You know, I mean, there's there's good uh, uh, nursery groups, uh, trade trade organizations that exist. So, like here, for instance, in Tennessee, we have the TNLA, the Tennessee Nursery and Landscape Association, which is it, it can be very effective. It's been extremely difficult to get the lawn care people or landscape people involved in it. And you know, th this is my uh, pitch to people. I was president of it for a little while, and. You know, I would pitch to people that look by attend. You are a landscaper. You're the one who are buying these plants. Come meet them face to face and demand better of your plants. That, that that's how to do it. You you get to this is your opportunity to sit across from a grower and demand better if you don't like what you're getting. Because what typically what we're buying here in Tennessee is coming from Tennessee because it's all coming out of McMinnville anyway, right? Occasionally we get something from mm -hmm. Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, or, you know, a little bit further away in Raleigh or something like that. But 98% of it is all coming from right here in Tennessee. Go sit across side face to face with them and demand more, demand better. It's, it's the smart thing to do. And I think this inner policing is going to be way more effective than bureaucracy, bureaucratic policing. Uh, it, just because the, the bureaucrats have a budget they have to follow and that's always blown through and, um, you know, you, you get some people that just want to show up for the job and some people that don't, if it's inner police, you know, you tend to, you tend to get a better overall uh, product. I mean, you know, look at NASA and SpaceX. Sorry, Sean Smith. Um, I'm just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, shots fired. Nat, speaking to that point though, we also have an invasive weed and invasive plant issue. And. To, to, to that point, my policy for those uh, invasive trees and invasive plants that are part of the landscape is I essentially have a kill-on-site policy. <laughs> okay? Are we still talking about... If it's invasive... Oh, we are not talking sorry. about weeds. plants anymore. We, okay. Yeah, we're, we're, talking about, we're talking about weeds. We're talking sure about we weeds, wink but into the camera, Ray. Wink into the camera, <laughs> so we know. You. Ray went full RoboCop. What is that RD two hundred nine? Yeah. The thing that pops up and shoots the dude in the meeting. That's Ray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, but seriously, there are invasive, you know, weeds, and my policy is always, if it's invasive, uh, it doesn't live. No, not negotiable. <laughs> well we'll move on to the next one here clean tech talk one of two ceo karsten tim of pivot bio microbe slashing agricultural ghg emissions this is part of clean technia mm. and we'll kind of jump mm. into here and you know i i opted 
to bring this up as a burn because you know how we were talking about earlier following upstream and environmental impacts of you know what you know what actually takes place we've talked a little bit about pivot bio b uh, before and their particular uh, technology is allowing for 40 pounds per acre of nitrogen to be generated through these nitrogen fixing microbes in the soil uh, the part that they kind of gloss over that they don't really talk about is that if it gets too dry, it stops. It has to be repeated every year. Um, and uh, there was something else, too. There was something else that interacted with it that, uh, that kept it from performing. But the, the most effective recording they have at this point is 40 pounds an acre, which is a pound of nitrogen, which is nothing to scarf at. I mean, I think that's a positive thing. But... Here we go. And this, this is a long talk here. And, uh, and if you feel like listening to it, I, I, in, you're into this kind of thing. I do recommend um, you check it out because it goes into more specific details as far as what, uh, is what they do. But, you know, here we go. We start seeing some of these things again. 37% of the annual global hydrogen market with 8 to 35 times the mass of CO2 of, of, as of hydrogen created. Uh, fertilizer is, is the result of fertilizer production, right? Uh, 265, 298 times CO2 global warming potential nitrous oxides, uh, because of fertilizer production. And you know, what's going to save us the microbes possibly, possibly, but how far away are we still from this? And what are the unknowns that are left out there? No one is being honest about the risk associated with this. But why would you be? I'm ser I'm I'm dead serious. Why would you be? When you're talking about something at the scale of a microbe, right? Uh yeah. that we have very little control once in the soil over the replication uh, uh, expansion of it, uh, death of it. It's pretty much out of our hands at that point, right? It's kind of like the life of a virus uh, in, in some instances. And, uh, and we it's see, obviously, how that's it, it kind, it kind yes. of is, right? And so my, my point is, is that why don't they talk about what they're doing to mitigate those types of things? And I think it could be done so tactfully just so that way we're more educated as the user, right? Because if I'm asking these questions, if I'm asking these questions, this is my hiccup, eventually they're going to have to answer it. Or are they just going to take the route that, you know what, we're just going to satisfy the, the, uh, the market that doesn't ask us these questions. And if you are going to ask us these questions, uh, we'll just bypass you altogether. That's exactly what I was getting at, is that I think that the, the downstream effects, right? So, and here you go, right? It's the trade-off, right? The, the downstream effects on these products that are trying to work upstream, we don't know, right? And I'm not saying that I'm the, the stodgy curmudgeon that's going to just say, oh, well, you know, any new tech is never going to be right. And this isn't going to, this isn't going to work and, and be a naysayer or anything like that. I'm just saying that from the standpoint of business, there's absolutely no way, no how that they're ever going to divulge this. It, but on the backside of that, Ray, I would say that, they probably don't even know and they might never yeah. know. Yeah. Right. They, that's, the uh, that's the beauty of it is you can, you can absolutely claim ignorance in this case because, Oh, we haven't thought of that. Or even if they have, or, you know, we're looking into that. Our modeling it, didn't you know, show us. It's inconclusive, right? Oh, it's inconclusive. oh Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Our modeling didn't show, show this yet. We are playing with, my favorite word these days, gain of function. <laughs> we are playing with gain of function of what are supposed to be technically naturally occurring microbes, except we've taken it into the lab. We do gain of function work. We put it back out in the environment and we have no way of knowing how it actually behaves once it's out in the environment. Uh, to me, that represents huge liability as well. Because what if it actually works and then works too well and then it turns into a case of, hey, uh, Ray, that golf course that you 
you know, sprayed this, uh, you know, nitrogen fixing microbe on. Guess what? It's working too well. And now Waikiki Beach is covered in algae. What the hell did you do? <laughs> right? <laughs> Goddamn raptors are, are eating the golfers, Ray. What did you do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What if it mutates? What if it mutates and instead of becoming nitrogen producing, it becomes nitrogen consuming? Yeah. Okay, it's, Matt, it's a real question. question. And what is what is their what is their methodology to predict that? What is their methodology to to uh, I, how do you control it at that point if it mutates there? I mean, are they are they already developing this to be resistant towards uh, certain bacterial sides that they may be using in crop production or something, and so it's already resistant to that. Now all of a sudden it becomes uh, uh, nitrogen consuming instead of nitrogen fixing. I, I, then what do you do? How do you control it at that point? But not even and not not how not long does that so take? That is where are they going to put this into into practice? Right, where are they going to put this into market? Because just like we talked about at the top of the show with the humic, way too many variables, folks. Way too many variables to sit there and control and say that it's going to do this in this soil, it's going to do that in that soil, and if you go over here, it's going to do something completely different. There's not enough time in the day, time in the year, right, for them to get that figured out before they come to market. And so tread lightly with all this stuff as as usual, but something like this, this is, this is tip of the spear stuff. you got to be careful. In in the same vein, the next one, uh, the next article here, is this greenhouse in Kentucky the future of farming? Inside App Harvest Quest to be the world's biggest ag tech company, save the Appalachian economy, and ensure the global food supply. What Man, started as what, a 500, I... a purchase 500 acre farm is now a 60 acre greenhouse. Hydroponic <sighs> crop production is supposed to save the future. And listen, it's not to say that there aren't benefits to, to agricult, uh, 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 hydroponic agriculture, you know, where you get to control your environment, you know, Im- implement more AI, more robots, all that fun stuff, increase efficiencies in that way, control, you know, outside diseases and all this fun stuff. Is the food quality going to be there? That's what I want to know. What are we sacrificing by having plants that come from soil And because can you really replicate that in hydroponic culture? Ray, how excited are you for your your 50th birthday to have a lab-grown ribeye show up at your doorstep? That's what I want to know. Uh, No, thank you. And I have experience with these, you know, produce that's produced, you know, alternatively not grown in dirt. And to me, that produce tastes like crap. And you know well, why it tastes like the, crap? It's because, because it doesn't have, it the, doesn't have content. the nutrient content that you would otherwise have. Because, like, here's the hot thing here in Hawaii growing vegetables aquaponically. So, in other words, right. you have tilapia and cat in here. Yeah, you got tilapia and catfish in a pond. They they eat, they grow, they got to go number two and number one, right, Ryan? In the water. And then that water goes to uh, the vegetables in the greenhouse, you know, being, you know, circulated that water continuously 24 hours a day. However, my experience with those those crops is that they don't, Tastes like, you know, vegetables grown in the dirt, good old dirt with adequate N, P, and K. They don't taste Where's the same. Where's PETA at on that? Where's PETA at on that? You know, completely unrelated. But pre-COVID, I went to the mall and I see these people st- sticking their feet in these aquariums. And I, can I say the F word here? I'm going to say it. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say it. I asked my wife, I said, what in the, is that? going on over there uh, <laughs> they were listen, putting their doctor. feet in the aquarium in an aquarium oh yeah so sitting i'm the- out right yeah. i mean ryan i'm listen, out like listen listen yuck. <laughs> this, is no this is no shit this is no shit my wife proceeds to tell me because remember i'm getting old i'm almost 40 years old i've let time pass me by so whatever's cool i have to rely <laughs> on my wife to tell me what is cool she tells me that there are these fish that go up and they eat 
the dead skin and exfoliate your feet. No, and man. Pay, oh, these people, these people, these no. people are paying 40, 50 bucks a pop to go in there and do Yuck. this. Stop it. I don't Ryan. even know. I'm Quit telling it. you. Yuck. Where's the pita? Did you throw the pita a, a, sh- a, a ninja star at the tank and just rupture it and tell these people to grow up and go somewhere? If they want to do that, listen, listen. It. If these people want to do that, go find a natural body of water and just dip your feet in it. Just go find a lake, hang your feet over a yes, dock. There it, is, dangle there it is. In there, there it is. There it is. This is great. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure Google. these people feel awesome. <laughs> oh. Doesn't this sound like something so Tennessee? This is Ohio too, but this is Tennessee. Hey, man, y'all want to go over there to Murphy's Brown Mall and, and we'll, we'll go and get our feet nibbled on by them fishies? No, in Tennessee, it would be like, you know what? We're going to go noodling and, and catch catfish, but this time, instead of using our hands, we're going to use our toes, okay? We're going to see how far we can get our foot into a catfish's throat and retrieve it from the water. <laughs> Actually, that's what we me, do down you know south. What the- Hiring a bunch of no. tiny aquatic creatures to come nibble on your toes is totally a California I'm sure they're paid, Matt. They're, they're not, this is they're a not Seattle. L- oh, this Angeles. isn't even Seattle to me. You know what this is, Matt? What? This is some third world Asian <laughs> shithole country kind of stuff. I'm, okay. I'm going to say, I, I will this, say, I will yo, say, Ray. Yeah. All, yeah. all of the people working on their raid. I've got nothing against the Asian people. I'm just saying they were all Asian. I'm, no, I'm, I'm Asian. No, yeah, yeah. Ray's no, Asian. I, I, I'm married to one. So before anybody starts commenting, just we need uh, to go no, ahead and I, get that prefaced out of there. No, I can say this. I can say this kind of stuff because this kind of disgusting crap <laughs> is something that they do in these filthy, unsanitary, dirty, primitive places. Okay, I mean, all I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. All I'm I mean, saying, Ray, if <laughs> I think all, I think all the fish with toe jam in them probably have a cure for COVID in them. I'm hoping. That's all I can think. No, right? No, I mean, it, it's just, just that I feel bad fish. for the fish. No, I, I feel just... bad for the fish for one thing, and for another thing, uh, it's like, my God, people, get a loofah, get a basin of hot water and some soap, and wash your freaking feet. I mean, the, uh, <laughs> you gotta get a, you gotta get a pet. Egg. You ever seen the pet egg, Ray? The pet egg, it like scrape. It literally, it looks like a cheese shaver. grater for your foot. Yeah, the pet egg. Well, Look it up, Ray. <laughs> well, actually, like the here in Hawaii, what some people We've do the is they take. By the way, they, they take like a, a piece of uh, of coral, <laughs> and what? that rough coral will sand <laughs> off anything on your feet and hands, calluses, whatever. It'll just, it'll just. Grind that shit right off. <laughs> to circle this back to full circle, I'm not against hydroponic crop production, right? I think that's fine. I grow hydroponically here at my house to, to, to learn it. That was the whole reason I started Deep Water Culture here was to learn how to do it. I've never done it before. And I think it's interesting. Um, but here's the thing. Is this going to be the, the saver of our life by keeping everything in a super sterile and controlled environment and eliminating all the trace nutrients that end up coming from our soil for the gain of, you know, what is the reduction in, in, uh, uh, water usage for these types of crops? I don't know. Is it any, do you, do you cut down your, your water consumption? Does it increase? What do you do with your wastewater? Cause you, you're still having to salt the water to fertilize the, the plants. And now you're having to fertilize with how many nutrients versus just typically using MPK and crop production. Right. So, there's, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me getting older and, and being a little cynical. I just, I don't think this is, um, I don't, I don't think this is it. It's I, not only you, man. It works for small segments, but it ain't it. It's, it's not let's only you. That out of the way. It's not. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's, let's jump into the returns and, and let's scrape. We're going to use the pet egg and these tiny bottom feet feeding fish to get rid of this <laughs> disgusting taste in our mouth. How about that? Yeah. Now we're gonna start off right here 
local teen does it all while fighting neurological condition. Out of Wooster, Ohio. I did not know Wooster was in Ohio, but thanks to DeMay and his comments, we were able to figure that out. This young man here is uh, suffering from a, a condition. Um, oh, oh, where did that go? I had it somewhere. That was out. Oh, Charcot Marie Tooth Disease. And let me tell you, in effect, well, it says right here, his nerves are dying from the inside out, killing his muscles. And you know Jeez. what? You know how big this kid's balls are? He's like, even though I'm suffering from reduced mobility, even though I, literally my nerves are being eaten from the inside out, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get into lawn care. I'm going to get a degree in agronomy, and I'm going to go out there and do the damn thing. I'm going to go make money. I'm going to work my ass off. This guy arguably went into one of the most physically intensive industries that we have out here. I'm not saying it's the most, but definitely up there as far as one of them. And he went into it like a hard ass. I got to say, guys, I'm impressed. This kid is, is fierce. No doubt about it. I mean, this is uh, somebody that in, a, in an area that's not far from me. And it's actually in the community. I went to school and got my uh, my first degree in uh, turf management. So I don't know if he's going to be going to same school, same branch campus, Ohio State or not. I'm going to find out. Reach out. Yeah, to he guy. went to. Uh, uh, he will be graduating with an associate degree in agronomy from the Ohio State University Ag Tech Institute. There you go. Same place as me. So I'm I'm teaching up there this semester. So I'm gonna have to look this guy up, and I will get him on camera, and I will do an interview for us, and and get him on camera somehow, or even get him on live with us. So I'm I'm excited about this. I mean, hey, listen, listen. You know, we all have a choice on how we spend our time here on this earth, right, Ray? And who knows right. how long that is. This kid, for better or worse, he has a pretty good idea, right? He has a better idea than most of us. And this is what he's choosing to do. So God bless the kid. I hope he has a successful career as long as it can be. And I'm looking forward to trying to meeting up with him and helping him out. So I will get that and uh connect with this guy for sure i'll be up there this and week. when you do let me know I'd, I'd like to go meet him and shake his hand and just tell him you know kudos for you for not being the kind of bitch that i i can be sometimes you know i know this kid goes through hard days that i can't even fathom and you know what he yep. gets up every day and he, and he goes and he conquers the world he goes to school he gets a degree and he and he moves into a very difficult industry to move into i mean that's unbelievable yeah, I'm just spe I'm just almost speechless. I'm almost speechless because, you know, this is a guy where, yeah, he's got oversized nuts. They ain't great nuts. <laughs> no, <laughs> they ain't great no. nuts for sure. I mean, I mean, th this this man has oversized nuts because, yes, he's uh, you know, got a got a medical history. Uh, Longer than a Pacific Islanders rap sheet, but he still goes out there and gets it done. <laughs> well, I mean, and we'll move on. We'll move on <laughs> to, the, to the next one here, um, and uh, we'll save the nutscaping comments for old Wooster son there uh, for when we meet him face to face, and uh, and we'll make him laugh somehow, some way. I thought this was interesting. Zimbabwean young farmers lead the charge in agriculture. Agriculture in Zimbabwe is on an upswing, and young people are the driving force. For example, the country said to harvest 2.8 million tons of maize this year, triple the 2020 harvest, and making it the highest output in 20 years. How many programs do we see in the United States right now that are successful, that are successful at moving younger generations into agriculture? You know, of course, we have uh, the FFA, right? Future Farmers of America. We have uh, 4F. Um, how successful are they at retaining the participants in agricultural crop production? How much of that crosses over into more niche industries like uh, like the green industry? I I don't see it. And the farmers I talk to, which it, and I'm going to preface this to say it's not many. I, it, I don't have a Rolodex of farmers I call every Sunday to check and see how they're doing. But the farmers I do talk to 
when I ask about young people that are taking the place of the elders in the industry, and they're like, they don't exist. They say in 10 years, 20 years, these people that are farming right now, they will not exist and they're, they're kids. And typically that's how it rolled down, right? The kid takes over the, the, the family farm. They're not there. They're not doing it. They're going into IT. They're going into healthcare. They're moving into cities. They're getting away from what they grew up with. Does that mean they won't return? Not necessarily. They might. I think, I think everybody, Sean Smith and I had a heady conversation about, you know, the desire to get back to the farm kind of thing. And, um, and I can say, you know, agriculture for me has become more of an interest the older I've got. Um, even though when I was growing up, I was like, well, I'm sure shit not going to be like my granddaddy and, and grow, <laughs> grow rice, you know, and it's you funny how that ends up going full circle, but kudos to Zimbabwe here with, uh, you know, the number of people between 20 and 31 getting into this and cranking out a record year, a three X record year. I think that's, I think that's pretty impressive. I was impressed. Yeah, you know, it just comes down to what, what I mean. I'll ask this, Ray. I mean, I know you talked about you know some of your upbringing. What got you into this, right? What got you into turf? What got me into turf was just the infinite pleasure and joy and accomplishment of watching and making something grow. You know, because. Uh, <laughs> I, I told you folks, uh, you know, off the show about how my grandfather basically ran what would be considered a rather efficient and high-yielding farm for Hawaii. But taking it full circle, uh, who now has the farm has turned that into the opposite of a high yielding farm it is now highly consumptive of time highly consumptive of resources and no it is not contributing very greatly to the uh, food supply locally either so you know so let's just say that my folks aren't talking to me <laughs> well you know, here's the thing. I think for uh, I can't put myself in the shoes of being in Zimbabwe or what that means. I do talk to a ton of young people, though, every year mm -hmm. that are considering this as a career. And you know, the the thing that's changed probably the most in the last twenty years is that the folks that are going into it now or thinking that they're going to go into it now have as little experience as they've had in the last 20 years. Like people are just up and deciding it's, it's no different than what a lot of degree, degrees are, you know, that we, when we grew up, like I'm going to be an accounting major. Have you ever worked in an accounting office? Have you ever, you know, done your own tax return? No. Okay. Well then how do you know you want to go into account? Ah, I'm good with numbers. And I, I think I'm good at this and that, you know, people just, just gravitate towards stuff. And, you know, for me, being a young person, I, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I mean, like I was dead set 17 years old and this is what I was going to do. I, I waffled a little bit and kind of talked myself into, I was going to do something more traditional, but I, I ended up not going through with it. I, I stayed with turf and had to explain to a lot of people like, you ought to go to school, learn how to grow grass, man. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. Man, I grew up pretty good in my front yard. I come over here. You can pay me. You can pay me ten thousand dollars a year. I'll, I'll show you how to grow grass. Like, okay, <laughs> whatever. So, uh, you know, like I said, everybody has their reason, and this is all I would say. You know, for the people at home that'll watch this, whether you're a pro or you're uh, an amateur, a hobbyist, whatever the case might be, is that a lot of times, I mean, I can think of very singular and very specific memories, right, in my time of growing up doing that that made me want to go into it it wasn't just like this culmination of events of like oh well you know like you know you've been dating this chick for a long time you ought to get married kind of thing it wasn't like that at all it was like very very specific visceral moments that i can look back to and say that made a difference and so maybe you're a hobbyist and you know you're raising a son or a daughter and they take an interest in it let them explore that 
let them explore that. Maybe it's not turf. Maybe it's something else to do with horticulture or agriculture. Let them explore that. It might not be traditional. It might not be the doctor, the lawyer, the scientist, the politician, the whatever that you want them to be. But I'm telling you, there is a fruitful and very uh, beneficial career, right, in the space of horticulture and agriculture. So that's all I got to say about that. You, you know, I do you find yourself with more interest? Like, if you would ask me 10 years ago my interest level in agriculture, I'd have been like, hell no. Not a chance. Not a damn chance. Nothing about I've it interests a, me whatsoever. Has it grown I've on a, you? recently i've met a lot more farmers right like legitimately like guys who have somewhere between 600 and like 3,000 acres right that farm within a couple hours of here you know where i where i live in columbus got to know them pretty well and understand now a little bit better you know the the ebbs and the flows and quite honestly there's a lot that that kind of you know trans transitions over from turf into agriculture, right? A lot of the same worries, a lot of the same self doubt, you know, self talk that you go through year over year, right? Of, am I doing this right? Could I do better? What's it going to take? Why did I, you know, when you should? And, and there's no, you know, there's no good measuring stick. That's the one thing I always give them shit for is that at least you got yield to go by, right? Like in turf, you don't <laughs> even have that. It it is it is literally the most arbitrary and subjective scale of bullshit that we have to put up with in terms of how well we do or how well we don't do, at least you have something that you can go by and say, hey, this acre right here was 183 this year, and it was 202 this year. At least you got a scoreboard. We don't even have a scoreboard. So, you know, when you put it in terms like that, and a lot of times they're looking at it like, you guys are just Nancy boys. You're out there on your green grass, and you got irrigation, you got this. And that and the other thing. And I'm just like, you know, I put it in terms. They've oversimplified. They've oversimplified a lot. (laughs) I'm thinking I'm thinking of one guy in particular that he has a seeding company that I know really, really well. He he runs a very successful uh, seeding company here for grass. Right. But he also farms, too. And he and I go back and forth so much about how easy you know he always gives me crap about how easy grass is and how far hard farming is and i give it right back to him the other way and so it's it's funny but you're right matt i think it's a different appreciation but also it's the same thing hey the last thing i'll say on this same thing in grass right no matter what this is taught to me back at ohio state the only thing that happens quickly in agriculture is crop failure (laughs) That said, we'll move on to the next one, which I thought was interesting. Uh, and I don't know if this was intended to be, uh, intended to be a return, but this is where we're going to talk about it. And this is at the University of Minnesota Turfgrass Science, and it is, what role does far red light play when light intensity is high? So our fine folks, uh, this is, uh, I, I don't know if Dominic Petrello actually I know conducted Dom. I know this Dom. Do you? Do you? I do. And, uh, and so they subjected different uh, uh, light radiant strengths and intensities and, you know, red to far red spectrum and, uh, and then monitored how that impacted growth and what they thought was going to happen ended up not happening. Since you know this guy, tell us a little bit about this. I read through it and, uh, and it, I don't know. It's, 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 a bit, it's a bit complex for me. Can you, can you make it simple enough for this dumbass to understand? Yeah, so, okay, so the usable light, right? Like, light stress is a thing on Bermuda grass, right? We know this. And we know about PAR, right, Ray? Photo, yes. Photosynthetic active radiation, right? So these are the mm-hmm. wavelengths in which light. Now, this is, and Matt, this, this would be a whole thing right here, right? We could do a, a, a video on who can spray light better onto turf, right? <laughs> Whose light is better to spray on turf, <laughs> Do you remember the sunshine in a bottle? Yeah, I do. Do you remember do. that product, the sunshine in the bottle? Yeah, what was that called? C3, uh, C4? C4, C4 was fertilizer? And then back in the day, uh, Florentine had Protocin, and they still sell Protocin too, that they would market like that, same thing. All right, so what Dom is saying here, what Dominic is saying here is that he is really, you know, he's a pretty interesting dude that has spent 
a lot of his career uh, since he graduated from the Ohio State University with his doctorate um, up there at Minnesota researching pigments and particularly how they are influenced by light, right? So the red to far red. Far red is no good. Red is good, right? So when we get into far red, that's where we have filtered light and we might see uh, degradation in the photosynthetic activity of those plants. So what he was trying to do here was balance out these two and figure out, okay, how much far red to red can we actually give it, right? Because all that we're doing right now is just basically uh, positing theories on how much a different species can get. So they're looking at hard fescue here, Ray, right? And when mm -hmm. they treated this stuff, what they found was that the amount of far red that they could give it was actually much higher than what they thought, right? And the uh, physiological response in the turf was also much better than what they thought. And so they're not sure what to make of it, but what would you say? Because you're in a, a place where light is king for your grass, right? And you, ha you can have some tough times and some tough weeks at a time there, you know, particularly in the wintertime and things like that. So tell me about what your feeling is on light stress for grass. It is probably the most, you know, not looked at, not addressed uh, issue. And I know our, our your friend and mine, Michael Woods, he actually made the point that, for example, you know the old old school varieties of Bermuda that are not adapted to lower light conditions. He made the argument that those are not suitable for use as you know sports turf or golf turf here in Hawaii because we don't have enough light to grow them properly most of the year. And you know, which is where he said. You know, I, I cringed when he said it. Maybe Zoisha would work better. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. He's but right. He's right, and then he's wrong. Because uh, light intensity and, you know, light utilization is, I think about that all the time. That's why, for example, I'm chainsaw happy. That's why my horrible bedside manner will tell people, you've got no earthly business growing grass in this location because you've got a high wooden fence. Your house uh, you know, is to the west of this plot of grass, and you've got uh, trees growing over this grass too. No grass for you. Next. <laughs> I think that would be an excellent uh, grass factor education deep dive topic is um, how light can influence growth on turf grass, right? It's one thing that's really mm -hmm. misunderstood because when, when we simply talk about, right, we're so used to, man, y'all want to go down there to that Lowe's and get me that shady mix. You got the shady mix down there or is that full sun? <laughs> I got that full sun mix for you too. If you want that, I got them both. <laughs> well, there's a big difference, right? Between what is shady and what is not, what is full sun and what is not right. So we can get into different things like, again, PAR, photosynthetically active radiation, right? And then we can also get into the wavelengths of light and how those get filtered, you know, through trees or buildings or things like that, that influence growth. And then also too, just DLI daily light integral, right? So, how much how much light does an actual uh, species of grass need, right, to live properly? And this is one thing in sports fields, a big thing right now because, you know, in particular uh, soccer pitches, soccer stadiums right here, definitely in uh, Europe, but more, more importantly here in the U.S. because we have such varied climates as compared to Europe, is they're building these stadiums that have super high sides, right, and covers that go out all the way over all the bleachers clear down to the field. And so the shade lines that they're giving, right? I'll give you an example here. So uh, the Columbus Crew Stadium, the new MLS stadium here in town, roughly about 40% of the field sees 
sunlight for more than eight hours a day in the summertime, Ray. There are parts of the field wow. that do not see that do not see any sun, right? For for more than like three months out of the year. So there's some significant shade issues that they're dealing with, and you know it's not unlike what you would see in home lawns too. So light in general, I thought this was a really interesting one to bring to the forefront and to share with folks and let them learn a little bit more about why light stress can actually be. A real thing and it can also go the other way too right it's not just shade it could be too much light and then we get into pigments and other things right that can block uh, uva and uvb and that's a whole another topic on a, in and yeah. of itself Boy, you talk about getting weird that's it gets it gets real weird in it, gets, it gets it, it gets in, it gets interesting turf. you think well, about how many stadiums is... have grow lights in the stadium to manage those shade lines right and yeah. i don't know <laughs> how many people know that but i'm saying like you, you know the big agricultural uh 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 irrigators that you know run on a radius or whatever the pivots yeah it's, the pivots yeah p- pivot heads it's like that except i mean a huge line of lights that just roll yeah. across a section of the field and until but you gotta you move see them. it and you, feel you gotta it, move them they don't move by themselves it's nuts it's, it's unbelievable nuts. yeah when you're spending you know uh upwards of 80 90 hundred thousand dollars a month in power just to keep your field growing it's serious business you've 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 reached an exponential level of insanity yes there you go look at this look at that's this. overseas all right it's carl danneberger from ohio state look at him <laughs> He's a he is a treat. Okay, so these guys have LEDs. That's interesting. We'll we'll do a deep dive into that on the next episode because there's a lot we can unpack there for sure on the light piece. But with that said, hey, real quick, just want to say we all match tonight, and not by not by happenstance. But if you are how, Matt, how would one <laughs> acquire one of these fancy shirts? Look. These shirts go to help offset the cost of the uh, the GIE live show. And if you want to check it out, head on over to thegrassfactor.tv forward slash shop. It's not available to the public yet. I'll tell you that right now. Right now, it's only available for the uh, early early order participants. And uh, and so you have to become a member if you want access to these right now. You got to hit the, the join button or join us really at the Patreon because... Uh, the money that's generated through YouTube goes back to Google for the most part. And so head over to patreon.com forward slash burn and return. It's because of supporters from guys like you that it would have no problems buying us a, 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 uh, an airport beer once a month. We're able to do these things and we want to continue doing these things. We want to remain independent. We want to have as few sponsors as possible. Um, and, you know, I, I, and I got to say, I'm super happy that Hone Health is is working with us because I think men's health is often important. It's something that we sacrifice because we're we're used to living, you know, kind of sacrificial lives, right? We're the providers, and you know, you do so at the sacrifice to yourself. But I think it's important we have to take care of ourselves, and I don't want to get lumped into a situation where we're reaching out to product manufacturers to make it worthwhile for us to do this. So. In order to remain independent content creators, check us out over at patreon.com forward slash burn and return. Um, and if you join there, you get to join the Discord. You can join the uh, the uh, early or the EPP is going to be the channel. Head on over to EPP and you will find a discount code for it to be able to buy these because obviously we don't want you paying $225 for, for a shirt. But eventually, over a period of time, these will become available. The grassfactor.tv forward slash shop. That being said, gentlemen, let's move on over to the mail pack. You've got mail. All right. Uh, we had one come in, and gentlemen, I threw it in our uh, show notes section there on uh, on the Discord. And this is from uh, uh, Chris here. He said, I had a soil test done and wanted to see what you recommended to get my soil balanced out. I will be aerating and overseeding within the next month or so. Also, do you have a yearly fertilizer schedule you recommend and what products do you prefer, preferably granular? Thanks for your time and have a blessed day. Well, uh. <laughs> uh, Chris, I don't want to get uh, too heady with you on the front end, but I'll, I will start right here. And uh, and gentlemen, I'll, I'll let y'all chime in. First off, you sent us a soil test from uh, 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 the the my soil. My people. soil. 
And my Matt soil. Cannot, don't you don't get it, Matt. You just don't get it. All right, sorry. <laughs> that, there's, there's a lot of inside baseball there, but here's the thing. I was told I should not speak about the my soul test if I don't understand it. Here's the thing. What we are seeing out of this test is basically what was able to be dissolved in water over a period of time, right? And potentially could some anaerobic conditions have played a part into this? Is that why you're seeing your pH so low? There's a lot of inaccuracy here, and there's not a lot of traceability or transparency about how these recommendations are made, how these measurements line up or correlate with what's considered the industry standard. Um, and because of that, we're not going to be able to look at this and make any kind of recommendation. I can tell you from reading the first line on this that says two to three applications of Jonathan Green's Magic Cow for acidic lawns is recommended to begin raising <laughs> pH, that there is nothing about this that's factual. It's already lost all credibility. And if you're concerned about, oh, well, how can you say that? Um, I did a reverse titration on Magic Cow to show that it has no more buffering capacity than just regular old calcitic lime that you go pick up for $4 a bag or $5 a bag. So I'm not going to be able to give you a recommendation off this um, if uh, it, because we just simply don't know what's being reported here as being factual, right? So, um, and that's because they won't share that portion of it. And, uh, and also, you know, just a solubility test is not enough to understand what the root is seeing when it's in the soil because there's a lot of interaction there that takes place that you have to take into account or can take into account. This may be good if you're about to go into uh, 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 V2, V3 with corn and you're trying to nail something exactly right, but th that ain't what we're doing. We're growing grass. So I'm sorry. We're not going to be able to help you from this. Gentlemen, what do y'all have to add? You know, if you're going to be aerating and overseeding, um, you know, if this bears out, if the, if the directional analysis is on point, and you know what? Listen, real quick, for the person that sent this in, I, I appreciate you taking the time to sample your soil. I appreciate you making the effort to try and understand what's going on. I'm just going to say that without any further input or information from the company with which you've tested, Matt's right. I don't think it's fair for us to give you a recommendation. And I think any time a recommendation is tied back to a specific supplier or a vendor, you know, Ray, Ray, you know yes. this <laughs> mm -hmm. from years and years and years and years of grabbing your ankles that this is probably going to be some bullshit in here. Not maybe all mm -hmm. the bullshit, but there's going to be some bullshit in here. Okay. That being said, my recommendation to you, if you're going to, air, if you're going to aerate and overseed is... I would get a test done to at least understand what your pH is like, right? Because right now, that's the only thing that sticks out to me that's like, hey, there's something going on here that you ought to understand a little bit better and, and have a better read on than just um, the eye on resin to tell you what's going on, right? So if you can at least do that, if you've put down stuff you know, previous to that, that's going to show up and hit your test and maybe skew some numbers, this, that, and the other thing. But understand your pH first. So... Do that in the most low cost way that you can. And then from there is come back later on this year, beginning of next year, sample again. I don't think you're gonna have any problem getting seed to pop in something like this, even at five three five, like it might be a little hokey on some of your phosphorus stuff, but you should be fine. But all that being said, you ought to consider a different soil test. And for the people that will watch this and uh criticize feel triggered or otherwise hey you guys are welcome to come on thirsty thursday any night of the week so we'll host a special show for you yep and just to sure will. make uh, and to also <laughs> be very transparent about that is that all invitations uh, uh, invitations to have a public conversation about this has been requested to have a private conversation no public conversations and uh, and that's the opposite way we want to go about it we want to talk about it very publicly and let them defend their stance and give them a platform to be able to do it and not keep things in secrecy. Um, so, you know, there we go. Um, 
I get I get a little frustrated about it from time to time uh, because I uh, you know this is one of those we've been times? talking about it for two years right yeah and I I am I'm frustrated and uh, and I feel bad because you know this guy obviously wants a legitimate answer and I can't give him one um so I don't know I don't know we'll leave it yeah. at that. Everybody, I want y'all to head over to the Discord and let's vote on the title of this show. So meet us over there. We're going to wrap this up. Ray, Ryan, anything else you want to head uh, a head up before we head out? Hey, man, it, it, it was good. It was a great chat. And uh, Ray, I hope you had a good ribeye for your birthday. Happy birthday. If you weren't on Thursday, Thursday, happy birthday, Ray. Ray just celebrated his uh, 89th birthday. 89th birthday. <laughs> 89. <laughs> He's Ray out there still the lugging most that. ornery man in all of America <laughs> for the 89th year in a lugging, row. Lugging that backpack, that five gallon backpack, baby. All right. Hey, <laughs> let's go do this. Thanks, guys. All right. We'll catch okay. you on the flip side. Good night. Good night.